Welcome, dear listeners. I'm Jonathan Carlin. And I'm Benjamin Carlin. And we invite you to join us through the Gryffindor, your one-way ticket to the enchanting world of Harry Potter. So grab your wands and dust off your broomsticks and join us as we unlock the secrets behind Philosopher's Stone Chapter 16, Through the Trap Door. Goodness me, does a lot happen in this chapter, Ben. Yes, it sure does. I mean, this is this is probably the biggest... I mean, it's the second longest chapter of the book. Yeah. Second only okay. to uh, Diagon Alley, which is chapter five. Okay. I um, mean, a lot happens there, too. A lot happens <laughs> yeah. there, too. And, and to be fair, I mean, chapter 17, the grand conclusion to uh, Sorcerer's Stone, Philosopher's Stone... Um, also rather vital chapter it's it's one of those where it's amazing where it starts and where it ends i know like the amount of stuff that happens in the next chapter as well is crazy but like yeah in this one it feels like like in my brain it feels like each task could almost be its own chapter but sometimes like because they go through all the tasks and all the tasks are so iconic they are Yeah. sometimes they're like half a page long or something <laughs> I, I know it's yeah it's wild um and it, it, the, the thing i kept thinking about the whole time was i was like man honestly the the obstacles for the philosopher's stone would have made for an absolutely spectacular like uh like final task for the triwizard tournament oh right you I know mean, it's like you have to go and test all your different abilities yeah and i mean in in so many ways like the maze is just very much like uh, this exact task or the the getting to the stone. Yeah, it's it, like it breaking really is. through a series of obstacles, except when Harry does it with in the maze, he d- is not able to like call upon Ron and Hermione. Yes. As well. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Where you definitely start to see the fact that you've you've got multiple different skill sets all at play, kind of contributing to the overall prowess of, of the of the golden trio as, as a yeah. collective. So I think yeah, I'm going going through it the way that we're doing it now. I think something that really stood out a lot more was like like they each have their moments for sure. Like everyone contributes and they couldn't have done it without each other. But like the number of times like Harry is the one who is like, uh, like I was writing down like every time we went through something, I was like, Ooh, that's a point for Harry or that's a point for Ron or whatever. And it's like, Harry comes out on top and it's not close. Oh, that yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like that though, because I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, Harry is supposed to be sort of like, you know, the, the central lead main character yeah, or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's his know. name on the front of the book it, here. It, it is. His <laughs> na- there, there are so many, there are so many times where I'm like, I, you know, sometimes I'm almost like, gosh, you know, Hermione almost is, is like a little bit uh, like cheated for not having her name. Like, uh, at least on the cover. Oh, you know, I know. Like, yeah, like and I mean, especially I mean, going forward. But right. in this particular set of obstacles, Harry does really shine. There you go. There um, you go. I will say that before we start, Ben, um, one, I was looking through through the charts as, a, as I'm prone to do Okay. at these times. So I was trying to see, you know, where we were with our, our beloved Guyana um, listeners. Yeah, yeah. They were constantly thrusting us to the top. Right. And I will say that right now, we, we've fallen a little. I think we're number six in Guyana right oh, now. Man. However, we are presently number one in both Argentina and Panama in entertainment news podcasts. How about it? So, booyah. How about Argentina's it? is pretty big. I mean, <laughs> That's, I'll take it. I no. will take it. There we go. What's up, Argentina? Well, well done with, uh, with Lionel Messi over there. You know, well, yeah, just, you know, crushing it. Excellent inclusion for planet Earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so let's let's go ahead and dive on into chapter sixteen through the trap door. We do have our chapter art here, which is a, a, a lovely illustration of of old Fluffy. Dude, um, I love this chapter art. I love how absolutely derpy Fluffy <laughs> <laughs> it is. So fantastic. You know, Fluffy is kind of like one of those interesting creations where it's like I there, there's a part of me that's almost like if you were just imagine like a small dog. Not not even a small dog, but like a Labrador with three heads. I mean, it would be pretty intimidating no matter what. Yeah. But then, I mean, you have to assume that Fluffy is about, what would you approximate Fluffy is the size of? I mean, I think it says like floor to ceiling. So, okay. Like an elephant? I'm thinking, I'm thinking like, mm, yeah, like an elephant. I I thought you were going to say bigger than an elephant. Like maybe. Like when I'm thinking like in the first movie, I feel like Fluffy (laughs) looks bigger than an elephant. Good. Maybe about like height wise, body height wise, about the same. But then, like an elephant's head, kind of like comes directly out of the front of its very horizontal body, and then just droops down. Sure. Whereas Fluffy's like raises up, and then has two more. 
all of which are huge. Yeah. Yeah. So. Fluffy does seem really dangerous, but there yeah. is something like really rewarding to me though, that out of all of the various professors, Hagrid's obstacle is the one that was the hardest to overcome. I know that there, there is something very nice about that. Um, although really, really the trick of course to getting around Fluffy is getting through Hagrid, which is, a, um, you know, I guess Voldemort's able to take advantage of that pretty easily, <laughs> which uh, it's so unfortunate for Hagrid that it's like, uh, it's so funny to me that Voldemort is the one who like, like, like tricks Hagrid into revealing the information when it was also <laughs> Voldemort who like framed him for murder. Yeah, Vol- Tom Riddle's relationship <coughs> with Rubeus Hagrid is is certainly one where um like uh, poor poor Hagrid is always on the on the negative end of that. Oh, I know of that feud. It's like Tom Riddle is like I can count on Hagrid having a large beast that I can, um, you know, uh, wheedle some information out of. I can rely on him having a large beast being the way I get something done. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, in the, the kind of like the really big and interesting question is, I mean, I would say chapter 16 above all else is the one that emphasizes Dumbledore's big plan in its finest mm-hmm. form. Yeah. Um, and like, so the the general premise of Dumbledore's big plan, I know we've, we've touched on a couple of times, but we're really, we're, we're kind of here and oh, now. Yeah. So, I mean, it feels like the time to discuss it. Um, but the basic idea is that um, Dumbledore knows of the prophecy. And with that information at hand and Harry's arrival at school, he's fairly certain that that Voldemort's attempted return is eminent. Eminent. Like, like we're, yeah. we're inside of like the end game now. Like now, now is when Dumbledore more than ever is going to have to really start to train and direct Harry on everything that he is going to need to do in order to topple the Dark Lord eventually. Right. And um, we, we we actually just did an entire um, video breakdown, uh, actually because of the Forbidden Forest chapter that we just did last week, yeah. um, where we were talking about astronomy and the ways in which, like at least within the wizarding world, it seems like the actual movement, like the future is quite literally imprinted in the stars. Right. Like the wizards aren't very good at reading it themselves, yes. but... Um, the centaurs clearly are very good at reading it. Yes. Like and like this is information they like closely guard in the same way that like goblins guard how to make like, you know, goblin made armor. Right. Or like, you know, the, the sword of Gryffindor that can absorb all the things that make it stronger. Like wizards don't know how to do it. A- exactly. But there's a couple of other exceptions that I think like so what I was going to allude to though is then when we first see Dumbledore in this very book, in this book. he pulls out a, a rather extraordinary pocket watch yeah. that instead of having your typical hands of a clock, instead that has uh, complex movements of what appear to be 12 different planets. It says 12 hands and had little planets orbiting around the edge. Okay, so the, yeah. the, the general idea here is that possibly if anybody within the wizarding world is capable of overcoming the challenge and, and seeing the world in the way that is, that is most similar to the centaurs, then it's probably Dumbledore. And I, and I think you could do that. You can back that claim up with the fact that Dumbledore, for one, does seem to be the only one who always knows what's going on. He yeah. specifically, know, even if he doesn't know exactly how like Voldemort has infiltrated, it seems like he he tasks Snape with watching over Quirrell. Right. So I think we can we can maybe assume on some level that Dumbledore knows that Quirrell is the one to look out for, but but maybe not the way in which Voldemort has like resided in the back of his head. Right. Yeah, I don't know. It's like hard to know how much he knows, but the, you're right. There is that scene where he tells Snape, like, keep an eye on Quirrell, will you? Will you? And it's like, why does Dumbledore specifically suddenly suspect Quirrell? But at the same time, like the amount of information to be um, gleaned from the stars and the planet's movements is like fairly specific. It is. Like when Harry is talking to Ferenz, he said, you know, Ferenz just straight up says, do you know what is hidden in the school at this very moment, Mr. Potter? And it's like what he's talking about is the Sorcerer's Stone. Yes. And it's like the Sorcerer's Stone like no one should know where it is at all. Right. Like the general wizarding, as far as they're concerned, like maybe it's with Nicholas Flamel. It's secretly at Gringotts, and then it is secretly moved from Gringotts to Hogwarts. Right. So it is like nobody should know where it is. Least of all the centaurs who just live in the forest. And yet, just by looking at the stars, they know where the Sorcerer's Stone 
is hidden, like not maybe specifically in the school, but like that the stone itself, the the stone is hidden at Hogwarts. Like that information is available to them by looking at the sky, which is crazy to me. It but, is. It is. Yeah. But Dumbledore has that pocket watch that basically looks like you know, some kind of the planets are moving and there's 12 hands on it. And it's like, it doesn't really make sense to have a pocket watch that doesn't just tell time traditionally because like the, there's no reason to overcomplicate this particular thing. Right. Like time is a fairly <coughs> simple, like you know, yes. aspect of reality. So, right. Yes. Which ironically is also <laughs> dictated by the movement of stars, of, of stars and earth yeah, yeah, right, of yeah. earth around the sun anyway right, <laughs> the way yeah, we right. keep track of time <laughs> right 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 yeah so there is that but it's like why not just have a regular pocket watch it's like to me because he pulls it out and it says Hagrid's late which to me it's like it's like it's as if he's read the time but it's like according to the future Hagrid should be here but he's not he's late or something right like no, the I, time it's telling isn't the present time it is time that hasn't happened yet precisely yeah precisely yeah yeah and um I, and I think on this exact same note you you know, like what you what you fast forward to is the other thing that the centaurs are being able to to see. And you you pointed this out to me in last week's episode. And I, I sort of had like a mind blown moment a little bit. But it's the um, it's basically the concept that while they're out in the Forbidden Forest for detention, as far as the centaurs are concerned, who have interpreted the stars, you know, they are they are aware of the fact that at some point in time, in order for the war to end, certain events need to unfold. And those events include Voldemort's destruction of one Harry Potter. And it's like, in this moment, in the forest, what they are witnessing is all of the puzzle pieces essentially coming together. Right. You know, in, in order for this event to take to take place yeah like and, harry's <coughs> here voldemort's here we know this has to happen okay it's happening right exactly um but the big thing that we learn is that like you know their interpretation this is by friends's own um like a, a like a mission when he's teaching later is that like even centaurs can have it wrong like you know like stars are so big and like their, their message is so grand right that like they only tell of of the the massive pieces like you know they're, they're not focused on on ants and their movement or, or whatever the case right. may be like so the fact that they happen to be off by six years is like that i mean it's a they, rounding error it's a rounding error it's like they may it's like instead of <laughs> you know instead of hitting the bullseye dead center they've hit the bullseye but like a little to the left precisely you know yeah. um but so my my point is especially as we we circle back to dumbledore here is that we also know that dumbledore is uniquely capable of understanding parcel mouth yep. uh, which we see in his memory of um, the, you know, the trip to the Gaunt Shack in Half-Blood Prince. Yep. We know that Dumbledore is uniquely capable of speaking Mermish uh, you yep. know, with, with the mermaids. Um, and so I think that like him having this like centaur level of uh, comprehension of what is going on inside of the stars as well, you know, and it brings you back to all of like the silver instruments that you see inside of Dumbledore's office for years and years and years to come. And it's like, it is entirely possible that all of these like little instruments are basically like helping him to understand the, the massive oh, yeah. like position changes of, of the players on the board. He's good at like reading unusual kinds of magic, even in the cave when he's like breaking it down and like putting blood blood on it and just touching stuff. It's like that's not the way Harry's ever seen wizards work anything out before. Yes. But like Dumbledore is good at it. And to that point, it's like like the centaurs even come to Dumbledore's funeral and do like some big like um like salute with the bow and arrows. Yes, they like, sure do. So yeah. which almost suggest like clearly they are familiar with Dumbledore enough to come give a salute. Right. So it's like it that even that suggests that maybe Dumbledore has spent time with them and like learned meaningful from them. Time. Yeah, meaningful time yeah. with them. Because like he even goes in and hires friends. It's not like, you know, I doubt that was the first time he'd met him. Oh, certainly you know? not. Yeah. Although that does that does uh land friends with a I think a permanent banishment from his colony as it a does. result. So yeah. I mean it's it's not that's not well received. Um, but ultimately we do know, and, and again, this is what you kind of discussed last week, but then the centaurs are unwilling to involve themselves inside of the fight against Voldemort until the, what is written in the stars has come to pass, which we of course know is Voldemort's killing of Harry, which does ultimately happen in the forbidden forest. And then after that attack, the centaurs do then join the battle and, yes. and kind of help turn the tide. But all of this to say basically is, um, is that like what, what our big, belief for this story is that all throughout year one and, and a lot of what you're going to see in this chapter is that there are challenges that are capable of being completed um that like even even hagrid being so well trusted by dumbledore like one interpretation of that isn't necessarily like i would trust him to keep a secret it might be i trust hagrid to reveal the information that i need him to reveal to harry at the right times because i know the ways in which like <laughs> 
like Hagrid's not infallible. I know how he is fallible. Right. Because the the other thing at the end of the day is that there are all these obstacles in the way, but like there doesn't need to be any protections at all because the mirror is not beatable. The mirror is not beatable, but then yeah. even as you go through each of the individual challenges themselves, there's also the argument that could easily be made for like, why put the winged keys in the room that has the door that needs to be unlocked? Why put brooms in there at all? You could just right. enter them into a room that has a locked door that can't be opened oh, through I know. traditional magic. And right. It's like, like there, boom, there's, a part, <laughs> there's a part where like you have to jump through the trap door and you don't know what's at the bottom. It's just like, hey, guess what? If you put nothing at the bottom, that's going to stop everybody. Yes, because you, know, you, will, right, just, you, right. you will just fall and <laughs> right. land on concrete. Exactly. And, like or rocks. You're just going to fall and crash to the <laughs> ground, and that'll be that. Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> so the big thing that, we, that we've always kind of subscribed to, or for years now, is this basic idea that Dumbledore has been very carefully watching Harry throughout the year. He's very carefully like kind of um, preparing him from afar at this point, where he's, he's taking into consideration the fact that Ron is good at chess. He's taking into consideration the fact that Hermione is good at logic, that Harry is good on a broomstick. Um, you know, that like maybe the, the trio of them could potentially work together to overcome certain things. The fact that he is given the invisibility cloak for Christmas alongside the flute, which will ultimately be used to uh, lull Fluffy to sleep. You know, yeah. all, like even that feels like no mistake. Right. Um, There's a lot of things in there, and there is one big thing in here that I, like, I know we were, we're already, like, sort of subscribed to this here that Dumbledore is, like, training Harry, or using this to, like, train Harry, or test how much, how good he is, right, or whatever. But, like, there was another little thing that I picked up on on this particular read-through that I was like, ah! Oh. So, uh, we'll get to that when we get to it. Okay, okay. But without I'm any, excited about with, that. Without any further yeah, ado. because we going to start we, talking about the chapter. Yeah, we, we've clamored on for a little while here, so let's let's go ahead and start um, where basically where we're picking up is um, we've made it to exam time, and kind of hilariously, it reminded me of the um, the line I brought up in the in the chapter about taking Norbert to the astronomy tower. Yeah, where it's just basically like a line that just says like Harry and Hermione would never remember how they even did it. Like, oh how, yeah, how they ever got Norbert to the top of the tower. It's it's almost one of those things where it's like everybody could recognize when writing the story that it would be too complicated and it would be an entire chapter on its own to watch them try to move a crate containing a dragon from the front door right. all the way up to the tallest the tower, tower yeah. with, without encountering Filch or Mrs. Norris or any other teachers patrolling or ghosts or anyone at all. So it's just one of those like blanket statements where it's sort of like if somehow they got there right. you know, and, and that's right. it. And, and that's, they took the exams and they took the exams because that's that's exactly how this chapter starts with one of these sentences where it just says Harry would never quite remember how he ma had managed to get through his exams when he half expected Voldemort to come bursting through the door at any moment. This is just like a one sentence way of saying like I could have given you a whole chapter about Harry taking exams and all the various things that he went through. I'm going to give you like three paragraphs right. and that's pretty much going to sum up ev everything he went through. I do think it is fun funny that for Snape's exam, they have to remember all of the ingredients for how to how to make a forgetfulness potion. And it's just like, hey, they tried to remember how to make a forgetfulness potion. It was like, it's, oh, I get it. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like doing it right, making it hard to do it right. I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's know? Like, does, like, are the fumes that you're producing in your forgetfulness pro potion yeah. like, actively working <laughs> against you? And I the know. real challenge is like, what kind of mental fortitude do you have in order to like persevere through this? Indeed. I also thought it was kind of funny that um, McGonagall, McGonagall gives points um, on their, their task of turning a mouse into a snuff box and it says points were given uh, for how pretty the snuff box was and I just wrote down oddly subjective for Minerva. I know. Like it's it's mm. sort of like 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 is it taking like Minerva's own like personal preferences in yeah. the style? Like what does she look for? I know it's box? like that's a bit minimalistic Weasley. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Or too, too ornate long yeah. bottom. Yeah. Are you kidding mm. me? Devil had whiskers. <laughs> you kidding? Me? Oh yeah. 100%. 100%. <laughs> Um, oh, man. Let's see here. Uh, I think one of the things they, they mentioned history of magic and it, like it just mentions one uh, answering <coughs> questions about bad old wizards who'd invent itself during cauldrons and they'd be free. And it was like like I it's like it, that the history of magic is so such an annoying class to me in the story because like it should be a pretty interesting class. It absolutely should. But it's be. like always so boring. It's like what how relevant can it be to know who would invented self stirring cauldrons when they the students in the present don't even use them. Oh, I know. You yeah, know, I literally wrote down this hardly feels like a horse. A this hardly feels like a historically relevant invention. Oh, I know. I was like, you know, I was like, why would you teach this? And I was like, no, 
about you know what we learned about like the cotton gin and stuff like that and I'm like that was that changed yeah. like civilization I know and <laughs> like, I'm like yeah and you know what they still make cotton shirts you right, know? yes yes to right. this day turns out it was a very useful thing to have created yeah. it's like yeah uh, you know what they don't they don't use self serving cauldrons even in potions class where stirring is like a big deal. This would be much more like if it was if it was common knowledge for us non-magical folk to be like, ah, yes, the inventor of the cheese grater. Right. It's like, it's not like I'm here to say that a cheese grater isn't a useful invention. It's just, it's just not it's relevant just not to like, relevant. Yeah. And it's not like who invented <coughs> wands or yeah, something. Precisely. <laughs> but no, I love your point too, because history of magic is one of those things where it's like, like we could almost even, um, if, we, if we were never permitted the opportunity to like write a founder series, um, like even just titling something the history of magic, and going through, excuse me, I'm sorry, <clears throat> and witnessing like the ways in which different spells were invented in yeah. the first place. Or like, you know, because I think what one of the things that would be so interesting about watching the founders would be watching them discover stuff. Because y you learn as time goes on that like a lot of the stuff that happens in magic doesn't happen for centuries after the founders themselves. Right. So like, you know, there's tons of magic that they just simply never, never got to see ever i know yeah you know, right like it'd be like mind-blowing i'm sure to be like you know and these are some of the greatest witches and wizards to have ever lived like a full millennium after they had ha had existed and they didn't know about self-stirring cauldrons they at didn't all. know about self-stirring cauldrons they were stirring them themselves like a bunch of chumps yeah they yeah. wouldn't have known about like you know sectum sempra or like um levit corpus or sleek what? easy's hair potion sleek easy's yeah. hair potion they wouldn't have any they wouldn't have the wolfsbane potion right yeah yeah yep. all these things were all invented these. way after actually the fact. speaking of werewolves they'd also talk about or hermione says she needn't have learned about the 1637 werewolf code of conduct or the uprising of elfric the eager so obviously i went ahead and learned about those myself oh yeah naturally of <laughs> yeah. course yeah is elfric a goblin yes elfric is a goblin yeah. despite having elf in his name it's it's like one of those things where it's like i feel like goblin rebellions is like 87 percent of what they learn about yeah it's like even though harry happens to be alive during a time of wizard war it seems like most of history is full of like wizard versus goblin war it does seem that way yeah yeah but yeah alfred the eager not much is known about him other than that he's apparently a goblin based solely which is information that is based on an image of him appearing on the cover of a book in the app hogwarts mystery wow. which man let me tell you guys massive pet peeve of mine because we have to do a lot of like research on harry potter stuff for our job as you might expect get to jay we get to yeah we get to do it yeah. we get to do it and it is so frustrating when i'll be reading on like wikipedia and they'll be like how wow how did i miss this when when was this information revealed is this like some like cool new thing and it's like oh it's hogwarts mystery mm-hmm Oh, this character, th this character revealed some interesting factoid about this, but it was in Hogwarts Mystery. I'm like, I don't know if I count that. I, I know. know I, I, I don't that. think I can count it. Yeah. Jacob's sibling yeah. comes up all the Jacob's, time. I know. It feels like there's too many decisions to be made by the player that could affect it. So like something like this, I'm fine with. It's like Elfric the Eager. Oh, we confirmed he's a goblin. It's like there's no higher level canon to dispute it. So like, I guess it's fine and it doesn't sure. hurt anything. So there you go. Elfric the Eager is a goblin based on Hogwarts Mystery. The 1637 Werewolf Code of Conduct. Uh, <laughs> was developed uh, was a set of rules outlining the responsibilities of werewolves such as preventing any possible attacks by locking themselves up securely every month so uh the problem was that it was a really ineffective uh code of conduct because no one sh signed up to or showed up to sign it since no one was prepared to admit uh to being a, a werewolf, werewolf due yeah. to the great stigma amongst the wizarding society Although, which i thought was like kind of like a funny thing <laughs> no that is that is very interesting and it, i mean it also was kind of fascinating what the what the procedure was <clears throat> specifically because that's pretty much what the shrieking shack is eventually built for for lupin anyway is, is a safe place for him to go yeah just to transform and it, not hurt anybody precisely but while i was looking that up i also came across another fun fact about werewolves that uh, answers a question we were having about werewolf cubs oh, the yeah. other day. Yep. Right. Okay. So here we go. One curious feature of the condition is that if two werewolves meet and mate at the full moon, a highly unlikely contingency, which is known to have only occurred twice, the result of the mating will be wolf cubs, which resemble true wolves in everything except their abnormally high intelligence. They are not more aggressive than normal wolves and do not single out humans for attack. Such a litter was once set free under conditions of extreme secrecy in the Forbidden Forest at Hogwarts with the kind permission of Albus Dumbledore. The cubs grew into beautiful and unusually intelligent wolves and some of them live there still, which has given rise to the stories about werewolves in the forest. Stories that none of the teachers or the game keeper has done much to dispel because keeping students out of the forest is, in their view, highly desirable. Wow. So there you go. 
That is why people say there are werewolves in the forest is because there are wolves that are the product of two werewolves mating during the full moon that are basically just hyper intelligent wolves, but they are not people that transform into werewolves. That is that is super fascinating, especially because I, I mean I think that it's Tom Riddle in the diary that claims that Hagrid once was raising werewolf cubs under his bed right so and this is probably that lot it's probably that lot which is always one of those things that always felt like hyperbole to me it was is sort of yeah. like it's like you know oh yeah hagrid would you know high five the giant squid if he could or something like that you know which actually hilariously uh, yeah there Fred is George, some yeah, yeah uh, like are, are hanging out with the giant squid this very page um but like it almost to me feels like a like a like such a sh- a stretch, such a reach. Like, obviously, uh, that's not really true. But if it's Albus Dumbledore, then it kind of could make sense because we, the, the very least, would have known that he would be a teacher at Hogwarts while uh, Hagrid was a student. So maybe that is how he could have permitted those cubs to go. That, I mean, that makes forest. sense to me. What doesn't make sense to me is how Hagrid would have gotten his hands on these cubs to begin with. It does seem highly unlikely. I know. Yeah, yeah like you were there for them, give, for the for the wolf giving birth for I guess woman in human. Form form how yeah this is the other tricky thing is that like i suppose that it could be the case that the wolves the wolf cubs would not be where they might be according to nature if they if they if they're i don't even know how to describe what i'm trying to say i don't know how this would work yeah Um, like how long would it take for the pregnancy to last and could they be delivered while the person was a human or would they have to be delivered while they were were a werewolf and then (laughs) like i suppose if that happened then the werewolf mother could just sort of be like you know out of their mind and be like okay I gave birth. See ya, and just abandon the cubs. And that's when Hagrid steps in to collect. That, that's that's my that's that's what I'm thinking is going to have had to have happened. Yeah, we're we're writing yeah. a backstory based we're on like such, such peripheral information. This is that that almost has to be how it works. But we talked about this for a while in an earlier episode, and I found the answer. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, okay, so got, here got we it. Go. No, I love it. I love it. Okay, that's and that's perfect. not on Hogwarts mystery. That's just like Pottermore archives. That's real writing. That's so real writing. Okay, that's we'll take canon. it. We'll take it. Okay, so as we move forward, though, uh, we once again find um, Harry, Ron, and Hermione flopping under potentially the beech tree next to the the, the beech tree. The uh, the Black Lake? Yeah. Um, where the Weasley twins and Lee Jordan are tickling the tentacles of the giant squid. Um, it is entirely possible this is the exact same tree that uh, we will eventually see inside of Snape's memory where he is being tormented by the marauders. Yep. Uh, it's the beech tree I'm always talking about. So I've started to started to notice that one kind of showing up left, right, and center. Um, let's see. The next page... Um, we get like a little bit of a line that I always think is kind of interesting, but it's Ron saying we've got a week before we find out how badly we've done. There's no need to worry yet. Um, this is kind of interesting to me because it sort of suggests that like at the end of the school year, there's quite literally just like a week that the students just spend at oh, the yeah. castle. Just not- at the castle. I know. I was like, that's probably the best week of the year, dude. I bet I was like literally like while, while I was reading it because like, you know, as as a uh, as a kid who didn't like love going to school necessarily, like there's a part of me that would almost be like, dude, exams over like I am ready to go home. Exactly. But I could totally see how it'd be like it'd be so fun to have that scarce time at the end of the year where it's sort of like, man, we're not about to see each other for a long time. Like you just want to spend time with your friends. It's like, it's sunny, it's warm. You don't have any, like the other responsibilities, like all your food is still tended to and taken care of. Like it honestly sounds sort of amazing. It does. Yeah. That sounds really fun. So, uh, that sounds fantastic. Uh, then Harry's scar keeps hurting though, so he's not totally able to enjoy it. He says, "I think it's a warning. It means danger's coming." And I'm, I'm like, I read that. And I'm like, hmm, is that right? It's not normally how the scar works. It's normally just like Voldemort's feeling and emotion, and that's what, so. I guess maybe it's sort of right, but yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's like I think probably what you could be anticipating here is, I mean, it is on this exact same evening that that um, Voldemort slash Quirrell are attempting to secure the stone. That's so that's true. If you're if you're Voldemort, like I mean, I, I don't think it's a warning necessarily. I just think that what's happening here is that like it's it's burning because Voldemort's like tonight's the night, man. Like I'm coming back. Tonight's the uh, night. Like he thinks this is. This is the graveyard of Little Hangleton, in, yeah. in my mind, right? Like, I mean, that's that's where we're at. I guess so. I guess you're right. Yeah, like maybe he's like feeling particularly anxious, right? So that 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 makes sense. There's also a line that's a, uh, by our, our, where it says, "And Neville will play Quidditch for England before Hagrid lets Dumbledore down." And I'm like, "Well, then sign Neville up for England because like one paragraph later, guess what's gonna happen?" No, but once again, this is, once again though, it's like, does does Hagrid let Dumbledore down, or does Hagrid do exactly what Dumbledore expected Hagrid to do? Well, I get. <laughs> 
<laughs> which, which is to let him down. Which is the well, I mean, he's but yeah, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. If you yeah. want to look at it that way, yeah. Uh, okay, but so yeah. Um, so Haggard, in fact, does let himself. Okay, this this is the thing that really I think sells me on the Dumbledore's big plan, even or the thing I discovered in this particular read through that I think sells me on Dumbledore's big plan even more than I was already sold, which is pretty big. Okay, um, it is when. Harry realizes how Hagrid got the dragon's egg. And he says, you know, don't you think it's a bit odd that the <clears throat> Oh, blah, blah. Don't you think it's a bit odd? That's what Hagrid wants more than anything else is a dragon and a stranger turns up who just happens to have an egg in his pocket. So what is interesting here is that it means that because he's realizing that Hagrid traded the information about Fluffy to get the dragon's egg, right? Yes, which means that Quirrell's actually had the information about how to get past Fluffy for quite some time. True, right? Yeah, so yeah. why hasn't he acted until now? Oh, it's a good point. You, know? you have to wait for Dumbledore to <clears throat> because leave. you have to wait for Dumbledore to leave. Yeah. But it, but here's the thing like and you say like, oh, we got to wait for Dumbledore to leave. But the problem is Quirrell is still the one who sends him the fake note about leaving. So it's not like he was just waiting for the opportunity for Dumbledore to be gone. Like he's still the one who sets it in motion. So why does he wait till tonight to set it in motion? Do you have an answer to that question? I, do, I think I think he's tried many times to get Dumbledore to leave, and the reason Dumbledore leaves is because he knows that Hagrid, that he knows Harry has figured out. Oh, I got that you. That Hagrid gave up the information. He's like, okay, Harry has the final piece of the puzzle. Harry has figured out how to get past Fluffy. I'm out of here. Yeah, because I mean, and I think that what we discover is that Hag or Dumbledore quite literally, I think McGonagall says it, like left the castle ten minutes ago or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like it's like it's so, like the moment Dumbledore knows that like Hagrid has let slip to Harry uh, too. He's like, I'm out. <laughs> no, you're so right. Yeah. I mean, it's all happening within like the same twenty minute span. So yeah. this yeah. this is almost like you can almost imagine. Dumbledore with some type of like um, like uh, what a telescope or something staring down from his from the headmaster's mm -hmm. suite at Hagrid's hut and he's like okay it's happening it's happening here we this go so, he's not even gonna have to miss exams this is perfect I uh, know because <laughs> the, the other thing is like if you're quarrel if you've waited this long just wait till summer man you know like you'll be at that some point Dumbledore is gonna leave the castle this summer oh I know you yeah, know certainly like, if anything Dumbledore is sort of like landlocked a little bit like I can't leave I know right I got the students are here I gotta watch the students you gotta watch you out know? for the students I know we're like one week <laughs> out here um <laughs> no yep that's that that is a super super mm -hmm. good point I love that so there so you go I think you're I think you're dead on the mark though because the timing is just spectacular. Yeah, um, it is like, yeah. Why, why does it just so happen that they're trying on the day realizes it because Dumbledore leaves because they've realized it. Right, right, yeah. right. And that's the other thing, too, is that it seems like it seems like Dumbledore's eventual return, you know, not to not to hop too far ahead, but it pretty much seems like Dumbledore is able to because we eventually Dumbledore does make it into the chamber beneath the school to save Harry, right? Yes, that is correct. There's also the the manner in which he like travels to the ministry, which is like sus like he flies, you know, like he flies when he can clearly just like flu powder over there or something. I, but when we do eventually learn that sometimes Dumbledore will take the Thestrals because he prefers that's, that. I guess that's true. I yeah. guess that's true. So I don't know. I mean, but I, it's I, like he could still just like get to the edge apparate. <laughs> No, I agree with you. Know, you. I, mean, I don't it, know. It, it is one of those things where it's like as skilled as Dumbledore <laughs> is. It's like, it's like, or he could just fox out. You could, know, he could just fox out. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe he needs to like <clears throat> save that. Maybe that's like a one a one time use thing, and he has oh. to save it for for the situation with Umbridge. Maybe uh, in Kingsley way way forward in the future. Um, there there is the little the little line here that we get um, where. Uh, nobody can really believe how Hagrid didn't see the face of the person he got yeah. the egg from. And Hagrid says, it's not that unusual. You get a lot of funny folk in the hog's head. And um, I looked ahead because I was like, gosh, I'm pretty sure ha Harry recalls this when he eventually goes in there to have like the first meeting of the DA. Oh, yeah. And it, it is a word for word uh, recollection that, that oh. Harry eventually does have. And he's like, I do kind of see how it wasn't weird for Hagrid. To, to be dealing with a cloaked figure like it's 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 sort of like a like a fashion choice <laughs> for the I mean, it's not even a fashion choice. hilariously like not only is the hooded figure there literally specifically trying to like conceal their identity 
for the sake of getting information. But then when Harry is there with the DA, there are two people with their faces covered, one of whom is Mundungus Fletcher and one of whom is like reporting to Umbridge. Oh, so sure. it's yes. like all of the people there, like they're hiding their face, like not as a fashion choice. It's because they're there to spy. And, and, it's a spy yeah. three out of three times. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Every, everybody is quite literally like trying to pull something all the time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hogshead, famous place for people to be overheard. Apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, Let's see. Let's say, oh, I, th- this was funny. I think they're like they run inside and they're looking for Dumbledore and they're like looking around and it says, um, uh, "Where's Dumbledore's office?" <laughs> and I just wrote down behind the Gryffindor. <laughs> ah, that's the name of the show. That's the name of the show. <laughs> Nailed it. Um, yeah, I also highlighted something from that exact same thing. Um, it said they'd never been told where Dumbledore lived, nor do they know anyone who had ever been sent to see him. And I just wrote next to that. That's kind of surprising. That like you know, especially because I think like a like a principal you know in a, in like at least an american high school like surely sees kids who are misbehaving every single day yeah like, you know like that it, it seems like one of the chief things i know chief yeah, it, responsibility it does seem like you should be able to know where the headmaster's office is like it says they looked around as if hoping to see a sign pointing them a direct pointing them in the right direction it's like yeah it does seem like there should be a sign though or something it you know? does it does <laughs> like, yeah like you should this shouldn't be a mystery <laughs> right right you know no i know um so then then they run into mcgonagall who they're basically th- this is like one of those situations where it's like so often you're like okay golden trio why don't you ever ask adults for help and this is one of those instances where they are correct about their assumptions as to what's going on they had the wrong person they're the wrong person but yeah. um but at the very least they are they are still correct that somebody's going after it and it does need to be protected and uh, mcgonagall basically you know she she drops her books, which when I was researching this chapter, I discovered is apparently like a McGonagall ism. Oh, does she? Um, so apparently, yeah, like like on numerous occasions throughout the story, when she hears something shocking, she's holding a large stack of books and will drop them. Oh my gosh. Do you know what else I discovered was a weird character trait that this character hasn't been introduced yet, but Cornelius Fudge bounces on his feet a lot. Oh, interesting. Okay. It does. That's yes. A, yeah, I can I can like now that you say that, I'm like, oh, I, I, I know that about him. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Like it's like one of those things I haven't really noticed. I was looking I forget what I was trying to look up the other day, but I was like, oh, Luke asked me if there was a spell that made people like like go the wrong direction or something. And I was like, I think there is. Isn't there like a spell that like makes people like shoot off in the wrong direction or something? And I was trying to look up like what word would like indicate that the spell had been used. And I, like I was like, oh, maybe bouncing off the walls or something. Right. And what it just came up with was fudge was bouncing on his feet. Fudge was bouncing on the balls of his feet. Fudge was bouncing on the balls of his feet. I was like, oh, okay. Well, how about that? <laughs> well, what do you know? Fudge is sure. <laughs> He's a little bouncer. Yeah, little little ball Bounce, bouncer. Bouncy fudge. Yeah, there you go. Um, but so then let's see here. What else do we have? Um, she tells him that Dumbledore has left yes, 10 exactly minutes ago. Yep. Um, and then she's like, how do you know about the stone? And uh, what, well, <laughs> which I just highlighted. I was like, well, the centaurs know. How do they know about it? You know, but I, which I was going to use to bring up how we talked about the centaurs, but we already sort of talked about them. So we we'll, just, them. we'll just move right past that. <laughs> got them covered. Yep. yep. Um, let's see here. Oh, she says Professor Dumbledore will be back tomorrow, which is like, again, the magical travel seems like weirdly slow right yeah. yeah it does it does kind of seem like one of those things but this i mean given everything we just said it it almost certainly to me seems like dumbledore basically just goes to like hogsmeade yeah and he's he's probably just like sitting there with Aber fourth just like yeah. waiting <laughs> he's like guess what tonight's the night bro so yeah yeah in yeah. April fourth is probably oh, you, you showed him the mirror didn't you and he's like i yeah, showed him the mirror, showed him the mirror. Hey, i gave him the invisibility cloak he was there that night yeah <laughs> how about <laughs> this it? this kid is amazing works like a charm just like hagrid does exactly yeah. what i expect <laughs> exactly what i think he's gonna do yeah oh man um one of the things during the exchange with mcgonagall that i i thought was kind of telling for again mcgonagall um was they're going back and forth and basically like you know expressing their concern about the stone and um McGonagall runs into them, I think, standing in front of the door, and she says, I suppose you think you're harder to get past than a pack of enchantments, um, which was sort of like very much just announcing that there's a pack of enchantments. Guarding. Oh, yes. She like let's spill some information. Yes. 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 yes, yes. I yeah. wrote that too. I like underlined that. I was like, oop, oddly informative on that front. And then on the very next page, like they um they set up like a, you know, a sting operation to try and make sure that they're like watching Snape to keep an eye on him 
or keep an eye on the teacher's office or whatever. And um, like Hermione is going to pretend to need a book from Flitwick or something. But it says Snape came out and asked me what I was doing. So I said I was waiting for Flitwick and Snape went to go get him. And I was like, well, that's oddly helpful for Snape. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yes. He yeah. just went and got him like, oh, right. OK, yeah, hold on. I'll, this is an need instance, a favor. <laughs> right. This is an instance where you like you almost want to be like an onlooker where Snape comes back having collected Flitwick and is sort of like Hermione. <laughs> and he's like, I do go? one nice thing. Oh yeah, <laughs> this was it. This was the moment. This was I was, it. I was gonna help Granger. Actually, there was a, there's a scene where he like runs into them outside, which I love the scene in the movie. But he says, "Be warned, Potter." Well, this is when he's like, "People might think you're up to something or whatever." But yeah. he just calls after them in the book and says, "Be warned, Potter. Any more nighttime wanderings, and I will personally make sure you are expelled." Good day to you. Which to me, it's like he's like threatening him, but I'm like, is he actually? trying to keep them safe like I think like to me like reading it through the like the lens of Snape is trying to help Harry is like he knows Dumbledore is gone and he knows that that means this is the night like Snape also knows Quirrell might try tonight so it was like se hey seriously seriously don't get out of bed tonight okay seriously well, tonight is not the night not the like, night you should, you should not do this <laughs> yeah um, we do get uh, like uh, Harry's big argument um, as to pretty much why he he's going to go after it. And it's one of those things that I think really sets up Harry for like just the kind of person that he is mm -hmm. and why he is so uniquely capable in his battle against um, Voldemort. But it says if I get caught before I can get to the stone, well, I'll have to go back to the Dursleys and wait for Voldemort to find me there. It's only dying a bit later than I would have because I'm never going over to the dark side. And this is like one of those things where it's sort of like Harry has not even known for one full year the full story. He has not known that he's a wizard. Right. And like, you know, he has dealt with some really dangerous blows and like has only even just recently been able to like sort of like uh, even shoulder some of the mantle of responsibility associated with what he's going to ultimately have to be up against. Mm -hmm. And as an 11 year old, he is basically declaring like, I am never turning over. Like I will die right. before yeah. that happens. And it's just like, Man, Harry, like I, if I go back to 11 year old me, I'm shaking in my boots. Oh, I know. Like, Absolutely. No way in the world. Yeah. yeah. True Gryffindor for sure. Yeah. Um, so I had highlighted that passage as well because it's just sort of like a fun little factoid here where he says, I'll have to go back to the Dursleys and wait for Voldemort to find me there, which just like fun fact, he'd have to wait like six years. <laughs> he would have to wait six years. It would yeah. be really disappointing be really for Harry. Dis like, oh, my, like, like, man, Voldemort there. sucks at finding people. Right. Can you just imagine sitting and wait for six full years being like, I really thought he was going to come like Everything on day one like, and yeah. now we're now we're like four and a half years into this and yes. I'm just bored. Yeah, this is uh, this is in reference to the um, the bond of blood charm that Dumbledore is able to put on Harry, which the bond of blood charm is one of the most bonkers spells in all of Harry Potter. It is is very confusing, and extremely yeah. convoluted, and it feels like one of those things that's just sort of like, I don't know if this could work in any other situation, but you, you almost just need like a reason to answer the question. Why doesn't Dumbledore just attack him while he's at the Dursleys? Yeah, exactly. And it's and like, oh, because, because, because he can't. Yeah, yeah, that, right, that, yeah, that's the reason. So hilariously had Harry returned to the Dursleys and stayed in the house. Voldemort could not have found him for another six years until he turned 17, which is another part of the spell. Um, Harry also predicts that um, if Voldemort comes back, there won't be a Hogwarts to be expelled from. He'll flatten it or turn it into a school for the dark arts, which is exactly what happens in year seven. That is exactly right. So yeah, I was yeah. like, "Ooh, that's a nice little prediction there, right? Um, I love when uh, you, after that sentiment that Harry says the part you just read, Hermione just responds, you're right, Harry, and it's just like, oh, like she recognizes it like right away. I know. Yeah, there, there's there's the moment there like um, uh, like where they're talking about the invisibility cloak and Ron basically chimes in and says, but will it cover all three of us? Uh, all, yes, all three of us. Oh, come off it. You don't think we let you go alone. And that's, it's like one of those things where it's like, I mean, everybody would love to think that they would have friends that would basically be like, yeah, mm -hmm. like we're with you. Like, yeah, you know, because I mean, similarly, like, I mean, again, these people have only known each other for you know, 10 months. Oh yeah. Um, it's like, I mean, this is not a huge span of time to put your life on the line over and, and oh, they do and they are willing to do it. And this also, I love this scene in particular because it parallels exactly what happens before the, um, the Horcrux on too. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. Yes, I'm fine. Yeah, a little, I mean, it's, no, I know it's just the, uh, the, you, you're exactly right though, because I mean, eventually Harry basically is so, this is the end of half Blood Prince. He's like, you know, Dumbledore is gone and he mm -hmm. knows he's going to have to go on this battle alone. And he's just sort of like, I'm not coming back to school next year. I've broken up with Ginny. Um, and yeah, it's, it's the, the, you know, Ron and Hermione are like, we decided forever ago. We're coming with you. And that's that. 
no talking us out of it. So yeah, I mean, once again, I mean, just like the the um, ironclad friendship that is involved here is so amazing. Yep. Also, then this is just like a little funny thing, like a sentence later where they're talking about getting thrown out and like her mind is like Flitwick told me in secret. I got 112 percent on his exam. They're not throwing me out after that. <laughs> I was like, OK, <laughs> <laughs> I said this isn't the best <laughs> argument. <laughs> yeah, no, what justify it however you need her body. <laughs> I absolutely love it when we both have identified the same passages <laughs> yeah, yeah. or wrote notes about it. It's like, OK, that's that's so funny. That stood out to both of us. Yes. Um, oh, I also like when Harry runs up to get the cloak it says he pocketed to use he pockets the flute to use on fluffy he didn't feel much like singing and like <laughs> that would have been hilarious and i literally <laughs> wrote hilarious to imagine this being essential know, like, like, like oh a, we have to sing what song would they sing but honestly it would have tied it nicely because it would have been just like at the beginning when dumbledore was like ah oh, magic beyond what we do here like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Even that's a Dumbledore big plan thing. Yeah, I know. It's he's like, like he's like music. literally music, music, music. You're going to be looking for one important yeah. detail for most of the year. The yeah. answer to the question you're looking for is music. music. It is not a magical answer. It is a musical answer. Uh, there we go. There it is again. I love how they stay up until uh, midnight or whenever they're waiting to go down there. And the thing is just the three of them in the common room. And even after Harry goes up back to his dorm to get the invisibility cloak and the flute, he doesn't notice it. The devil's there and like they have just failed to Neville notice Neville in the common room the whole time. The whole night. <laughs> Neville's literally just sitting there with <laughs> his frog. I know he's like, don't yeah, with the frog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't notice me. Don't notice me. Ninja Neville down there. Yep, yep. Yeah, I love it. Fantastic. Um, Neville really being a real Gryffindor though. He says, You'll be caught again. Gryffindor will be even more trouble. And I was like, Oh, look at Neville. Look I at know, Neville. I know. I know. Proving it to himself. I mean, and then, like, yeah, I mean, and the fact that he's even putting like House Gryffindor above everything else, you know, is like it's it's just such a testament to the eventual true Gryffindor that Neville actually is is this is another one of those moments where it, it'd be curious to know how much of this exact scene is explained to any of the professors because Dumbledore also knows that this happens and awards Neville points right. for it. Exactly. Um, I guess someone finds him there. Somebody could have found Neville. I mean, there's a question as to how long the Petrificus uh, Totalis. Yeah. I was like, well, be able to pronounce it. Um, there's a question as to how long that spell would last yeah. after Hermione left or if he would ever be able to stand up. I will say that that um, if you've never like ever and, and I don't recommend it like but I remember uh, in middle school I used to go and hang out with my friends in the neighborhood in the middle of the night we would like walk around our neighborhood and stuff like that yeah. and there was this like one night <clears throat> where we were like hey can anybody just stand straight up and fall backwards like like just fall flat on your back without like it's kind yeah. of like doing a belly flop but just on land and it's just painful for no reason and I remember doing it and everybody was like whoa that was so impressive and I was like I can't breathe yeah knocks the wind, out of, knocks you, the wind yes. out of me but I was like gosh fall with no ability to stop yourself on your face. I mean, that's a broken nose. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm, I do remember one. There was one point in college where me and um, our buddy John were walking back to his uh, apartment and uh, it, it had snowed the night before and I don't know what we were doing, but he was just like John Carlin. I'll give you a dollar if you fall on your face in the snow right now and like less than half a second later. I was just like, okay, <laughs> I fell straight on my face in the snow and he, uh, he I think he was so shocked by the speed in which I like <laughs> accomplished like, the task. Yes, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Boom. Okay, did give you, me a dollar. Did you get a dollar? I did. He did. He was like, here you go. That's okay, amazing. Here's a dollar. That's amazing. Well, but well I think about that. I'm like, what if there'd been something under the snow? <laughs> oh, I know. Gosh, I know. can you imagine like a little manhole cover or something? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So bad. That would have been the worst. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but there wasn't. I'm fine. There we go. So then then we when we move on to a uh, and again, this is it actually uh, pairs nicely with one of the questions that we got at la the end of last week's episode. So they're they're basically like traveling through um, um, you know, the, the corridors on their oh, way yeah. to get to Fluffy uh, and, and through the trap door and they stumble across Peeves yep. and the uh, quick thinking on the feet situation here. And, and this is like, it's kind of interesting because th there's a couple different ways to like write this passage in my personal opinion, where it's like, again, this is already like the second longest chapter in the book. It's not like we're lacking for details or anything. You could just have them not run into peeves. And I, yeah. I, I don't think anybody would have been like, hey, wait a second. How would they get through the corridor so easily? It's like, it's like they're already in the, under the invisibility cloak. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> and they I mean, they've already got Norbert to the top of the astronomy tower. Of course, they don't remember how they did that either. But <laughs> uh, but um, but like, you know, they did that without running into anybody. So it's like um, this is this is one of those where it's like 
what what happens is they run into Peeves and quick on his feet. Harry basically decides to impersonate the bloody Baron yeah. um, and says uh, th- like Peeves the bloody Baron has his own reasons for being invisible and Peeves basically just like rolls over yeah like so sorry your bloodiness Mr. Baron sir and you know like goes through this That's whole your thing Peeves voice. Yeah, I don't know why I went with that. I felt like <laughs> it felt so wrong. Yeah um, anyway, but <laughs> That's what I did. So now we're now we're stuck with that forever. <laughs> live on the internet. Um, but why does this work so well? Like this to me feels ridiculous. But it also, I mean, it's like we we started uh, posing the the idea that once upon a time, like like Fred oh. and George are like the only people who Peeves ever takes. Um, like orders from yeah. when and it's specifically when they're leaving in order of the Phoenix to go and start Weasley's wizard wheezes. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of like in opposition to Umbridge, who is basically the like antithesis to everything that Peeves represents. Mm-hmm. I mean, she, she is all order and, you know, no chaos. And that is, you know, like Peeves MO is, is right. order or, you know, lack of order and chaos. Yeah. And so it's like one of these things where it's like, I, I almost have to believe that as menacing as the bloody Baron is supposed to be, as like a character, um, I have to think that he was like a goofball, like, oh, like, you think so? like the, like the creation point for Peeves himself. I mean, like, it could be, um, I've always just interpreted it as him being like really afraid of the Baron cause he's like covered in blood, but yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That's yeah. It seems like, weird. I, I mean, I like, I don't disagree with you. I mean, that's, yeah. that's like, I mean that to me, I feel like is the base explanation, right? I, I feel like I want a better. Explanation. Yeah, I do want a better explanation. Yeah. They don't, they don't, this isn't fleshed out. I think the reason this obstacle shows up in here, cause you're right. You could just have him just th- not run into peeves at all. And it's not like, Hey, wait, blah, 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 hey, um, I think from like a, a writing standpoint, the reason this is in here is because like you have all of like Dumbledore's pre lined up obstacles for them to overcome right but then this is like another way that harry demonstrate it's a way to show that harry can think on his feet even for um things that dumbledore didn't even plan for him to have to get over and and i mean i don't think dumbledore set peeves up there it's like peeves is just in the castle and it's like this is really this is really the first obstacle and it's like the un the unplanned one and harry just skates past it yeah i mean and, and that's that's you know um the unplanned the unplanned the obstacle. unplanned task. Yeah. yeah the, asking out Cho. Is asking out Cho. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, it, like, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a very like superficial version of this exact thing showing up, but we do obviously in God with the fire have the first, second and third task. And then there's the unexpected task, which is asking somebody out on a date. Um, so I suppose there is something to be said for things like that, that like Harry will inevitably have to face. But I also feel like, um, so then immediately after that, we basically find ourselves uh, going into the room where they find the harp that is playing by itself. Um, and Fluffy is asleep and they're they're essentially like getting ready to like find their way into the trap door um, where they they jump down and uh, oh, well, hold on. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Before they do that, they're like they're underneath the cloak. Harry turns the other door. Says, if you want to go back, I won't blame you. He said you can take the cloak. I won't need it now. <laughs> I just was like you have no way of knowing that. Like <laughs> at all. What are you talking about? You're still planning to sneak up on Snape, a fully qualified wizard. Don't you think an invisibility cloak would be useful? It could so, be. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know. That, that was like one of those where I could I could sort of see a world where it's just sort of like, well, once I'm down there, like then I'm in it, you know, like yeah. it's just going to be what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, what I was going to say was, um, yeah, so then they, they find the trap door. They jump into the, tra- the, the trap door. They fall and fall and fall. It says down, down, down and flump, which um, I did write down. I think it's like the perfect sound for this particular occasion, like a flump sound. I wrote excellent use of the word flump. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, once again, <laughs> once again, we're on the same page. That's a, that, yep. that is so funny. Um, but so then he looks up and the light through the trap door is the size of a postage sa- stamp, yep. which is impossibly small. Well, Ben, I'm glad you brought that up Okay. because once upon a time, many videos ago on the main Super Carlin Brothers channel, I think we have a video called Does Sorcerer's Stone Predict Everything? Okay. And in that, I, um, we did some math and we figured out there's like there's like a formula you can figure out to see like 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 to figure out the perspective of something like if something what looked to be the size of a postage stamp, if you knew the actual um, like measurements of it, you can know how far away you'd have to be for it to look that small. Okay. Okay. So 
Uh, in the video, we assumed that the trap door itself was two meters across, so about like six feet or so. Okay. And in order for it to look like a postage stamp, you would have to be about 275 feet away from the um, from the trap door for it to look like a, the size of a postage stamp. Okay. Which means that's like tw- what, 270 feet? That's like 27 stories or something, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, which, which is a long, long way, um, which means they would have also been falling for about four to five seconds, which if you've ever like, you know, been falling through space for more than a second. That's a really long time to be falling. It does feel like forever. Yes, we, yes. we have done a, a fair bit of like our own, like sort of like kind of air quotes cliff jumping. Yeah, uh, where we jump off rocks into water, and yeah, there there is this sort of like odd feeling where you like have left you have left the solid surface that you were sitting on, you know, the rock or whatever, and then you were just sort of like. In, in nothing, you know, yeah. you're, you're just falling <clears throat> through the air. Um, actually, similarly, I also did a bungee jump once upon a time where I fell, uh, I don't know, for like six straight seconds or something. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, super ab- far. Absolutely terrifying. Um, yeah. The, the thing that I followed it up with as far as we're looking at math is that um, then Hermione and Ron join Harry down there where uh, Hermione says we must be miles under the school, and so I just I did the quick math on that. It takes about twenty seconds to fall one mile. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So in the event that I mean, obviously, like it seems like the the hole would be much 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 smaller than a postage stamp at that point. Yeah. Or um, else the trap door is massive. Or else the trap door is massive. Yeah. yeah but yeah. at that point, I mean, I don't know. I guess I guess it could be a fluffy standing out, but it doesn't seem like there's any reason for it to be that big. Right. But Certainly, like in the movie, it's not. Even when I was doing this, I was like six six feet seems like pretty generous. It does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that seems like a pretty big trap door considering, yeah. it, you know, it just doesn't need to be that big. But yeah, I mean, so even miles plural would suggest that they fell for at least 40 seconds. Oh, well, here's the other thing. If you were according to the math we did in that video, if you're falling for four to five seconds, it means you've achieved a speed of 75 to 80 miles per hour of falling. Goodness so gracious. these better be some truly flumpy vines they're landing on, Jay, you know, the flumpiest. They are. I mean, yes. we can only assume they're the flumpiest. Yes. I mean, yes, indeed. We got probably they even reached up and like, um, you know, caught them, nestled them down to the ground. Right, 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 right. Before starting to strangle them. We, I mean, to be fair, we actually literally just made a video a couple of weeks ago as well, not to get too off track here, uh, because in the movie Frozen, there's a claim that you could jump 200 feet into uh, freshly fallen snow. Yeah. And it would be like just like falling on a pillow and so i i was doing some fact checking on that particular occasion and discovered that in world war ii there was a uh pilot uh who fell from his plane and his parachute had burned up and fell i think eighteen thousand feet into fresh powder and, and did survive survive so yeah. te- i mean is it possible technically possible yeah, for it for it to happen. So there's that doesn't uh, mean it's not absurd, though. Anyway, yeah, Harry Ron Hermione fell uh, roughly 27 stories at about 80 miles per hour and landed with a flump with a lump. With there a flump. you go. There we go. Yep. So absolutely. Um, but no, this this finally brings me back to the point that I was going to make that you were kind of making about peeves, which is that like uh, they are then being um, strangled by the devil snare, which it turns out the flumptacular plant is in fact. Um, and Harry, in amidst the chaos, just yells, "So light a fire!" Um, which I think Ron will end up crediting Harry for. Um, I think he says like. Uh, lucky Harry doesn't lose his head in a crisis. There's no wood, honestly. <laughs> no. Um, this, 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 no it's like wood. so. I mean, I understand the point you're making about Peeves <clears throat> in the hallway and sort of like you know this shows like Harry's resourcefulness. But I also felt like this particular task is also like going to at least some lengths to do the exact same thing. Oh, absolutely, it is. Yeah. This is just one that's set up on purpose. Right. Right. Um, right, right. Yeah. I gave I gave Harry, Ron, and Hermione all a point for this one because Harry's the one who suggests the fire, and then <laughs> Ron is the one who reminds that she's a witch and then Hermione actually does the spell. Uh, yeah, I, I think yeah. you got to give Hermione a little little tilt here because she's yeah. it's like literally it's like are, are you a witch or not? It's like Ron, are you a wizard or not? Like, know. you know, like but to be fair, the bluebell flame is something that does seem like a like a bit <coughs> of a signature spell of Hermione's um, which it, it like to the tune of 
it could be comparable to like, you know, Harry's Patronus or Expelliarmus or something like it, yeah. Like she may be particularly like adept at, at this skill. Oh, for sure. And I, I've sort of been under the impression that the boys are not capable of like reaching their wands at this moment. Either. M- maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they've been they've been strangled a little bit more yeah. than than Hermione, who is the, yeah. the last one to get there. So uh, that that's fair. I mean, I think you could probably give each of them, you know, a fair, a fair bit of credit yeah. for making it past that. I one. think there's a, a fun line at the bottom, too, where it says if they've been a dragon, a fully grown dragon huh, Norbert had been bad enough and I just love that it's like that is like a, a little bit of foreshadowing I think for uh, Gringotts further on down the line in um, book seven where they in fact are in a similar situation where they're deep underground and they're trying to break into something and now they do run into a fully grown dragon and what are they going to do right 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 yes that's true that's true yep they then they successfully get past it yep um okay so then let's see here is it the yes the first room that they encounter is going to be the winged keys yep uh this is once again obviously like the like such a such a apparent charm uh, um charm um uh, it, it, this is another one of those things where it's like Harry's prowess as seeker feels like such obvious inspiration for why this task would be chosen for this particular situation. Yeah, this one's all Harry. I mean, I guess Ron recognizes what the key is supposed to look like, but this one uh, Harry gets all the points for. I think um, this is just sort of as a complete aside for we do. Um, we sell uh, candles, as you know, we do. And yeah. inside those candles, after they're melted down, there's like these little collectible charms there inside, are, which yeah. is like, you know, really fun. So um, some of the like magically inspired candles that we sell, one of the charms you can get is a winged key. It is. And we have a bunch of them here at the office. And my kids were here the other day and Luke has read the first book and he was like so excited to find the winged key. And then, of course, once one of them finds it, they all want one of course so i had to find three different winged key charms <laughs> that we somehow the had yeah, that we yeah. had here at the office and they are just like running around the house like having a blast playing with the winged key charms that's so, amazing I know, that's amazing like, my kids love these yeah <laughs> that's incredible yeah no i love that um one of the things i did write down is that um in the movie actually one of the things that happens is that once you grab the correct key the other keys then kind of go onto the offensive and sort of attack yeah um and they start going like a kind of crazy just as soon as you touch the room. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. You're right. That's exactly <clears throat> it. So um, that was actually something that I was like, that actually I think is a good inclusion that they that they sort of expanded on this idea for the film. Yeah. Um, because I do think it makes it all the more menacing. I mean, hard enough to catch the key in the first place, but then to also have a bunch of, you know, flying bullets for yeah. all intents and purposes. I mean, you know, like like sharp flying fat or fast flying metal keys. I mean, that's, that's pretty dangerous. It yeah. you up pretty quickly. So I also, um, this is like, whenever I read this one, I'm always like, how, how did Quirrell do this? I you know, know, I know. Yeah. Like it, it actually takes all three of them and Harry's like a, a super talented seeker. Yeah. And they know which one it is because someone's already caught it. Right. Like he would have had to have found the key the first time too. Right. Yep. That's exactly. You know, it. So I'm always like, wonder if he just like, you know, summons it or something Could or be. has like a way around it. But uh, I, I would assume that they would account for that. You know, like the Aloha Mora doesn't work on the door, so it feels like Asio wouldn't work on the keys. It does like, feel that way. You have to play the game to beat the game. Right. It, it's always one of those things that drives me nuts uh, when they're Horcrux hunting is that they, they try the Asio thing over and over and over, and you're just sort of like, yeah, it doesn't work, y'all. It's, yeah. It's, it's, like, it's not going to be that easy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I guess you always got to try. You got to try. I don't um, know. From there, we make our way into the uh, the chess chamber, the chess chamber, which is where Ron obviously gets to really like kind of showcase his abilities. One of the things that I found kind of interesting or, or curious about this, if you will, is that um, wizard chess just by itself is kind of already a thing. And this is supposedly McGonagall's obstacle and transfiguration is her task. And so I was like, what did she transfigure into the pieces? I know. I guess it's just like making them come alive. Possibly. I know. Because I I guess on the one hand, you don't need um, like somebody shouting instructions for the opposing side to know what to do. Yeah. Um, Like it will just kind of like play on its own kind of as if you're playing like against the computer. computer. Yeah. It says they say it on the next page. Just McGonagall transfigured the chessmen to make them alive. Okay. So So I I I guess guess that's it. I guess it's kind of a no. They got to the top of the tower. They're alive. Transfiguration. McGonagall. Her task. Ron. 
Yay. <laughs> Yay. It yeah. works out. Um, there, there's a couple like little like interesting things about this though, where, where it feels like almost like um, there could be other consideration in mind. I mean, the, the, the general idea is that they have um, Harry and Hermione take over a uh, castle and a bishop, which would be two pieces in chess that you'd probably be overall less likely to sacrifice early. So that's, that's like a reasonably good strategy, but you also could have just had Harry take the place of the king. And then it would essentially be like, so long as you don't lose, nothing can happen to Harry. Right. You could have done that for sure. Right. It almost like as far as like chess goes to like rooks are more valuable than knights or bishops. Okay. Um, so it's kind of surprising Ron doesn't take the rook spot. Sure. Since he's going to be like a little bit more of the valuable player here. Maybe, maybe it's like early foreshadowing that he that he has like a like a like a quiet uh, even he's unaware of crush on Hermione. Oh, he's could trying be. To, trying yeah. to like be like, let's put, let's put you in the, the overall safest. Right. Yeah. And the, safest I, I think it's fun to have Ron like I'll be a knight. You I, know? A little bit because I mean he is going in. He's he, he is commanding the army. So to speak. So yeah. I think it's, it's kind of cool to have him have him play as the knight. Um, however, the one of the questions I always have sort of is like we know uh, very quickly like th- the way that the other pieces take one another, if you will, is, yeah. is by destroying one another. Yes. But like I, I was wondering like, you know, as Hermione goes up and, and I think steals a piece um, it, it, it's sort of like what does Hermione do go and like sort of like punch this statue I know or I wrote that too like, I'm like does she smash them right yeah it's like, yeah. like how, how, do, how does this touch like go around? please move I'm, I'm taking you now right I, I that honestly feels more likely yeah. um, but then as we move to the end of it um, basically we see you know Ron's big sacrifice which is super sad and, and of oh, course yeah. like in the situation like they don't know what they're sacrificing I mean like you know the, like Ron could die oh I know in like the situation absolutely could like they I mean as far as they've seen I mean it's this is one of those where like the book is worse than the movie yeah in terms yeah. of like the, the like in the movie Ron is riding on top of a horse and the queen stabs the horse and Ron just sort of falls off like in the book the queen just like backhands him across the face just like, and, like clubs not, him, yeah. just clubs him and it's like you know it doesn't mention like a sword but you know, if if in the book the queen had had a sword like she does in the movie, like and she doesn't hit the and she just hits Ron, like I don't think in the book he's like um, riding on the piece. He's just standing there. Yeah, I think you're right. You yeah. know, like <laughs> she just would have chopped him right in half, man. I know, I know. It yeah. feels very dangerous. Um, and the. Uh, Actually, this is this is always one of those scenes where I would love to know the behind the scenes on it a little bit if you watch the movie, especially like on like a computer where you can kind of like frame by frame it. But when Rupert Grant, the actor who plays Ron, falls on the ground, there's a piece of rubble that sort of like skates across and like cuts his face. And it's either like a really good piece of editing, which is entirely possible, or Rupert Grant actually has his face cut in mm. this scene because it's almost like you can see like the rubble like sort of like scatter across him or whatever and you can see like his cheek like move and then there is like you know blood visible afterwards and it's like you you couldn't have frozen the scene in the moment and gone back and like painted in the blood or anything so it would have had to have been done in post but i've always wondered like is it possible he like actually cuts his face in that scene oh that'd be very interesting to know yeah Yeah. um anyway hurt yeah, did he get hurt? Um, but then as we move uh, to the final piece there, uh, we do know that Harry is playing Bishop. And this is like one of those things where it's like it's kind of hard to know if it's a if it's an error or just sort of like a poor way of describing how a Bishop moves. But um, Ron has gone down and the last move that has to be done for checkmate is Harry moved three spaces to the left. Yeah, um, I, I mean, left diagonally is fine for me. Like, I, I don't think this is like a massive error or anything, but but at the very least, if I was standing on a checkerboard and somebody said to move three spaces to the left, I would move like or orthogonally. What is that word? You, you, I, always, I only know it from like playing board games. Oh, you mean like like left, just left or right? Like left, left, right, north, south, basically like cardinally, like yeah. cardinal directions. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, when you read that, no part of you is sort of like left on thinking that Harry is the bishop is not moving diagonally. Well, early on the page before he does like when Harry his first command to Harry is Harry move diagonally four squares to the right. Okay, so he does preface it before. Maybe he just stops saying diagonally. Maybe so or Maybe whatever. So. And like we know Harry knows how to play chess, so it's like it'd be an illegal move for him to do it otherwise. But yeah, what happens yeah. if you do it illegal? What happens if you don't know the rules? <laughs> yeah, right. Are you like just stuck in those little squares? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. 
Um, I think the the next room they get to is the troll room, which they're able to just walk right through. But this, if you're like, not that you need to like think about it for very long because you're about to figure out the secret anyway, but this could be like, this is your last chance to like connect the dots that it's Quirrell and not Snape. Oh, sure. That yeah. the, because like they say like only two left, Quirrell and Snape. And it's like, you know, like um, once you go into this room, I guess you could think the troll was either Quirrell or Snape. So once you get to the potions, you'll know that the troll was Quirrell's room. So you'll know that Quirrell is associated with trolls, which could then um, lead you to the like you could deduce out that he's the one who let the troll in the first time. Yeah. So this this again kind of goes back to that thought where like if you were watching this uh, episodically on like, you know, um, like week by week, chapter by chapter in like TV series form. And again, I, I would, I would propose this as like 100 years in the future to the point where it's like, it's been long enough to where it, like the plot of this story isn't maybe everyday common knowledge necessarily. Right. I could see a world where you get to episode uh, 16 of this series and people could start theory. I mean, realistically, you could just read the books and know the answer to it, but I could see people theorizing and being able to work backwards by the end of this chapter and sort of sort out that they that you might think it's Quirrell right instead of Snape. Like, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Like, I think that there could be enough information left on the table for for people to like suss it out, right? Especially if theorizing is still a thing 100 years from now. Oh, for sure. For sure. Which almost certainly you know, will be. Yeah, you know, you know yeah, yeah. People, people are just going to watch the TV and not read the books, you know, way too lazy for that. Right, right. Yeah. The one thing I have always found to be kind of interesting is that obviously Quirrell has gone through before them and all of the other tasks have been reset in some capacity. So they're all like back oh, to I know. they're back to normal. So the fact that the troll is actively still stunned, I always do find to be kind of interesting. I mean, obviously, like it's it's not a video game. It's it's not like it's meant to be restored for each person. I guess the winged key has kind of got still some, got the yeah you know and it, like I guess, but like even the devil snare, it's like you know the, certainly Quirrell must have burned it as well yeah or done something to get through it and it seems like it's recovered just fine whatever he did do it exactly yeah so it's it, <clears throat> I don't know I don't know I mean I don't know that I find it surprising or problematic or anything for, yeah. for that matter I, I, I mean I guess I guess it's just sort of like <gasps> huh the okay. surprising thing to me is that on the next room the the potion that lets you walk through the black fire has is like one gulp and that has refilled itself exactly yeah yes yes, yes, yes. which is another one of those like why would it refill itself like or or even if you're quarrel i mean you could go through the next room and just start changing the position of the potions around like yeah you know that way like if anybody's following me like they're gonna get the wrong answer they're gonna get the wrong answer. that's true boy that would have been sneaky so yeah let's talk about the potions because that's the next part yep um this is the logic puzzle that hermione figures out i always 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 whenever i get here i so badly wish there was like like a diagram like a picture that went with the riddle oh that, so would that be you could like nice. try and figure it out i'm like like can you I'm sure people have done this online and just been like and like drawn it in such a way like so that it makes sense or like like but I think it'd be so fun to try and solve yourself because I love little puzzles like this. No, I know I, it is really cool and I, I think well, I was doing like a little bit of research about the riddle itself and I, I think what the the um, underlying sentiment for people who have kind of like done like a deep dive on how the riddle all plays out is that you need to know specifically uh, which of the potions is the largest and the smallest I think uh, specifically in order to solve it. Right. So without a diagram per provided by the book, the words alone do not provide you enough context for you to solve it. Okay. I think is what it comes down to. Okay. Well, that um, is a bummer. I know it, it is yeah. a little bit of a bummer. So I agree with you. I absolutely think like for future reprints, if anybody's ever listening, something that would be super cool would be to give us a little picture of a bunch of in the same way that like sometimes when you get like a letter from Hagrid, it'll be signed by Hagrid or if it's signed yeah, by McGonagall, yeah. it's signed Just by like McGonagall. Just like put a little, little, a little drawing with the potion bottles in a row. Yes, you know? exactly. Yep. I don't, I don't think that I think that that would be a great thing. Like that's that's not like a picture book that's just providing a way for the reader to intera yeah. interact with the story. But there are illustrated versions of this book. Well, which to no, wait, yeah, I just read this and I don't think there was an illustration of the post. Well, you know what I was reading in the Mina Lima version, not the illustrated edition. So maybe uh, maybe in that one there is. Maybe I don't know. Okay. I okay. Report back. But it sh it feels so obvious to me to do that because it'd be so fun to work out. Yes. Um. And and I love <laughs> this one for Hermione too because I mean this is like totally in her wheelhouse. Um. There is a line though that we get from Hermione that I think is pretty great. Um. It's it's uh. She says this isn't magic. It's logic. A puzzle. A lot of the greatest wizards haven't got one and or haven't gotten out 
ounce of logic. They'd be stuck in here forever. And this is like one of those things where I think, you know, again, for like an 11 year old Hermione to have realized this kind of sentiment, I have found this to be true in the world. Like I often find people who are remarkably intelligent. Yeah. But like the like high intelligence, high computing power of your brain doesn't always translate to someone who then makes like logical decisions. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that like being able to merge uh, like logic with intelligence is what breeds wisdom, which I think is ultimately like what most people are, are going for. Mm-hmm. But computing power is like the speed of your brain and the speed of your brain is only as useful as the attached wisdom that you can then place right. behind it. Yeah, I mean, um, this is this is the entire show. If you've ever watched Big Bang Theory, this is like where like um, Penny meets yeah where Penny Sheldon. meets Sheldon where yeah. it's like Sheldon has nothing but logic but he can't do anything and Sheldon and like like B- Penny is like completely street smart but she has no logic and like right, the two yes. are constantly outsmarting each other in ways you could not possibly expect yes yeah and, yeah, yeah. and it's then it's like yeah then but it's like th- the more they become friends it's like the the better everyone is because they can like join their powers or whatever exactly yeah. yep nope that's a, that's a really good one um so anyway then we have the final dialogue this is another one of those I often I often earmark it I'm, I'm sure I'm going to out myself now as team Hermione um but the little exchange I think with Harry and Hermione and the fact that it comes down to them is always like one of these early nods that I felt like mm-hmm. it, it could have been them. It could have been, been them. I, I don't die on this hill for what it's worth. It's yeah. not, like, I'm not like that, like hardcore of, you know, like whatever. Um, but there, you know, it does seem like a, like a really good exchange between Harry and Hermione. Um, we get a really great moment that I think basically answers the entire question, which is why isn't Hermione in Ravenclaw? Um, but basically, uh, Hermione says, Harry, you're a great wizard, you know, and Harry says, I'm not as good as you. Me, said Hermione, books and cleverness. There are more important things, friendship and bravery. And this this is exactly like like Neville as well. It's like Neville values bravery. And, right. and that's why he's like the ultimate Gryffindor. Mm-hmm. And, and I think in this particular situation, Hermione herself is basically like books, cleverness. Like, yeah, those are those are fine. But like I'm good at them. I'm, clearly. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 yeah a little, little like shoulder shrug there. Um, but yeah, I think the emphasis on friendship and bravery are are what mark her as a true blue right. Gryffindor. I also feel like this is this line in particular is like supposed to telegraph to you the reader that like what actually makes a good wizard isn't being good at magic. It's being good at friendship and bravery. Like, yeah, these are qualities of a good wizard not how well you can like cast a spell or something right like your technical yeah. abilities which whatever. even like it, it, it even speaks to like the tasks they're doing because like one of the things that like Harry's really going to need to defeat Voldemort is like his friends yeah and like that's what all of these tasks really are it's like you have you will have to rely on each other to do them yes yes yeah. it's yes and and you know I think like I, I mean again you know with Dumbledore's big plan you sort of like can fast forward basically to one of the last conversation not the last conversation that Dumbledore ever ever really has with with Harry and King's Cross Station where he like specifically says like I counted on Miss Granger to slow you down so that your uh, what does he say so that your hot head didn't outpace your good heart yeah um, I think is what it comes down to but like even that I think suggests to me that even this early on Dumbledore is recognizing the friendships that Harry has forged so early and has included obviously his closest friends as elements in what Harry will need in order to ultimately overcome Voldemort. Like, yeah, like the the things are set up with Ron's strength in place with Hermione's strength in place. Like they, they like account for the people that Harry will keep with him all the way to the end. Right. He does. Yeah, he totally does. Totally Um, does. So anyway, then, then we basically, uh, we see Harry take the potion, which feels like ice. He's able to walk through the flames. Um, and we end with the cliffhanger that says, there was already someone there, but it wasn't Snape. It wasn't even Voldemort. Yep. Very, very good cliffhanger. I highlighted that sentence in particular. I was like, I'm not sure there's been a sentence in any book that has impacted my entire life like more. More than that one right, right. there. Yeah. Like, like you think that's like, this is this is the moment the book got you. Right. Yeah, that's insane. And I mean, it really is because like, I think as we as we kind of go, I mean, you could even turn one page and see who it is. I mean, you can see it in the chapter art, but like this is sort of the moment like, you know, I I feel like one of the things that I've learned um, that I never pick up on so much as I've been reading through the books historically is like 
the number of little notes that I've been able to write down and be like, eh, I don't know about this or like, ah, that's a reach or like that, that can't be right. You know, like whatever, like there's, it's not like there's not like flaws inside oh, of, yeah, of right. the story, but like, like when you're reading it in like one big continuous flow, it's easy to be, it, it, it's easy to just allow these things to like sort oh, of yeah. like, 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 you know, this is like the way we're reading it is not how you read books, you it, know, precisely. Yeah, yeah. We're, like, I mean, we've read these books like, you know, 50, 100 times or whatever. And it's like, you know, now I can go through and like write a little note about this and I will notice every little thing that like doesn't add up and stuff. But like when you're reading it the first time, you don't notice any of that stuff. No, of course. And that's not yeah. how you read any book the first time. No. And, and, and I don't get I don't get stuck on these details to this day. Like, I mean, I don't ever like think back on, you know, like even I one of the things I, I wrote or I highlighted in the page prior is, um, you know, Harry and Hermione are talking to each other. Uh, Harry basically says, go back to the last room, get Ron, take the brooms from the flying key room, get to the trap door, pass Fluffy, go to the Owry, send Hedwig to Dumbledore, uh, let him know we need him. Uh, and Harry says, I might be able to hold Snape off for a while. Yeah, and it's right. like one of those things where it's like, like it's like, mm, Harry, no, you cannot. You cannot like, even. Maybe yeah. if you had the cloak, I, you know. <laughs> by, by, yeah, by, possibly. <laughs> um, but like, you know, it's, I mean, there's there's a million little things that are, you know, the posted stamp, the, the miles under the school. I mean, like, I mean, you could pick any number of things and you could you could critique it to, to no end. Right. But when you're a kid and you're reading this story or when you're an adult and you're reading this story, you know, it's like, Th- this is the moment where where the magic trick itself of the story is is being delivered to you, right? Like, like the, the this is the twist. Yes, this yes. is it, and and that's the thing. I mean, that all magic is is sort of like like it it's it's look over here so that you don't see what's happening over here. Right. And that is sort of like the fun of like a book about magic is like it has a magic trick itself. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and this is this is the flourish. This, this is, is the it. Moment. Yeah. Boom. Um, so we are we I think with that we can pretty much close off chapter 16 and and point our sails towards Ooh. the last and final chapter of our first book here in our podcast read through chapter 17 the man with two faces. Oh yeah, very exciting. So much happens in the last chapter. In the last chapter, I cannot cannot believe it. Sometimes I'm like, it's <laughs> wait, we get we still got to fight Quirrell. We still got to have a conversation with Dumbledore. We got to talk to Ron and her, like Ron and Hermione, and then we got to like you know award the House Cup, and we got to <laughs> it's like you got to get back on the train and get back to London. Like so, all of that's going to happen in one chapter. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So literally, yep. I mean, th- that's what's shocking about it. So I mean, not to not to give too much away about chapter 17, but um, <laughs> like uh, you're walking in, you're you are miles apparently under the school. You're about to face the mirror of air said, do all these types of things. And then the last page of the chapter will involve uncle Vernon. In I London. know, right? Like you know, uncle like, Vernon is in the same chapter as Voldemort. Yeah. You it's know? like, what, <laughs> what, how is that even possible? One yeah. of the most like remarkable, you know, like packing in and like action into a chapter ever. So yeah, it's going to be so much fun to, to dissect that one. As we, I know as we, as we get to the, the big finale next week. Yes, we're almost there. Woo. So do you have a review for us to close oh, out? Absolutely. I do. Absolutely. I do. This is uh, let me make sure I get the right person. It's from Carter. Okay. Uh, it says everything the Super Carlin brothers do is great. They're both very knowledgeable. I've been reading a long time and listening to the podcast. It has been such a joy. Question: Snape was keeping strict eyes on Quirrell, threatening him and just being mean to him. So why does Voldemort still trust Snape while living in the back of Quirrell's head? And the I, I thought I picked this one out because one, we're obviously like this is the chapter with with Quirrell, or, or you know we're getting right up there. Yeah. Um, but this answer is actually right in the books in Half Blood Prince. Yes. When Bellatrix and Narcissa come to visit Snape, and uh, Bellatrix, fun. for the sake of the audience, asks Snape all of the questions that you've forgotten to ask or that you haven't been keeping track of, but boy, sure she has. And one of them is, why didn't you help Voldemort get the Sorcerer's Stone? And Snape just answers her straight up, and he says, I think you next want to know why I stood between the Dark Lord and the Sorcerer's Stone. That is easily answered. He did not know whether he could trust me. He thought, like you, that I had turned from faithful Death Eater to Dumbledore Stooge. He was in a pitiable condition, very weak, sharing the body of a mediocre wizard. He did not dare reveal himself to a former ally if that ally might turn him over to Dumbledore or the ministry. I deeply regret that he did not trust me. He would have returned to power three years sooner. As it was, I saw only greedy and unworthy Quirrell trying to steal the stone, and I admit I did all I could to thwart him. And then he goes on to say, the Dark Lord's initial displeasure at my lateness vanished entirely. I assure you when I explained that I remained faithful, although uh, although Dumbledore thought I was his man, yes, the Dark Lord thought I had left him forever, but he was wrong. 
So that's basically the answer. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So this is this is like the what what is it what does Snape ultimately become? Is he a, a double a, triple agent? Is it yeah. Is is that how it works? So a double agent would be playing both sides, but like the the or, and I guess he is just playing both sides. Maybe maybe it is just double agent because he's he's sort of like both. But this is a situation where it's like he was on the dark side came to the light side and is now telling the dark side that he convinced the light side that he was able to. I think it is triple. It is triple right. Because if you were just like a secret agent, you'd just be like on the other side pretending to work for them. Right. True, true, true. Right. And so a double agent is like he's on the dark side. A double agent will be someone who goes to the other side and actually starts working for them against your original enemy. Yes. Okay. Right. So he starts on the dark side, goes to the good side, then goes back to the dark side and... <laughs> But is operating, but it, but on, behalf is operating on behalf of the good side. Yes. So yeah, I think it is triple agent. Triple agent. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so so pretty highly complex. But I also feel like it's a pretty elegant response as well. Like I mean, for all intents and purposes, I mean, when it comes down to it, Voldemort never reveals to Snape, which he could have. Um, and I mean, that would have made things a lot more complicated. A lot more complicated. I mean, that's that's my, maybe not even the worst. What if? Like, what yeah. if Voldemort had revealed himself to Snape in book one? Oh man, that is a good question. I do yeah. not know. I have to think about it a bunch. I like, know. Would he immediately? Have I don't think Snape would. Oh, yeah. Something to chew on over the weekend. Something to chew on for sure. Yeah, we'll have to think about that one. There yeah, we go. It's a good one. Uh, but as ever, guys, if you have a review for the podcast, be sure to let us know, and maybe you'll get to hear it here on the show. I know. If you have a question for us or anything like that, we will try to get to it. Otherwise, join us next week for the finale of Book One, Chapter 17, The Man with Two Faces, here through the Gryffindor.